Boom. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The next session is about to start. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good, beautiful, sunny morning to you all. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this room again. Uh, before we start day two of, of this year's Tatra Summit with a uh, main panel discussion on a very important issues, which is the capital markets, it is also my pleasure to introduce to you uh, two of our very fine uh, young professionals this year. Uh, out of a cohort of 11, who will give you um, a taste, if you like, of a paper that they have been working on together with our other nine young professionals, which is their take on Ursula von der Leyen's manifesto, a union that strives for more. Um, the two ladies will be uh, Scarlett Varga, who is the deputy head of development at Bruegel, and Katarina Kertyshova, who is a non-resident research fellow at the Hague Center for Strategic Studies. So without further ado, ladies, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, and thank you for the warm welcome. Um, well, on behalf of the Tatra Summit Young Professionals uh, 2019 cohort, I would like to warmly welcome all of you this morning. Um, as mentioned by Susanna, 11 of us were tasked and asked to um, critically look through the proposals by um, uh, President-elect van der Leyen, choose one that, is, that we think it's a priority, and try to come up with policy recommendations on that one priority. It was not an easy exercise. We threw this in a poll, and after uh, the votes, uh, we had 27% for the European Green Deal, and 27% for the Europe uh, in the world topic. As we had to choose just one, we went for the latter, um, not only because we think it's a timely issue, but also because we feel it's a cross-cutting one, which touches upon all the other five. Um, to make our proposal more concrete, we also chose uh, three regional areas and three thematic areas, um, which we will present to you today. The three uh, regional areas are, as you might know, EU-China, EU-US, and EU-Russia. And the three thematic areas are climate change, AI and cybersecurity, and defense policy. So I'll start with EU-China. Um, while acknowledging the importance of the ongoing discussions, obviously, on Chinese SOEs, on the China-Africa EU uh, triangle, on investments, and uh, concerns on rule of law, we, however, thought that it would be wiser this time to focus on the need for a stronger EU branding on the world stage. Um, we feel that in most, we, we see that in most world regions, the EU has a stronger development role uh, than China. However, this is not visible enough. So we feel that there is a need for a strong uh, joint effort of European countries getting together and you know, acting as one block on the world stage. Um, from our EU-China discussions, the national transition, um, natural transition sorry, um, drove us into the EU-US discussions. Uh, transatlantic relations have changed significantly since the World War II. We all know that. Um, they are structurally different. Uh, first, the current confrontational stance between the US and China puts the EU in the middle somewhat, and we do not really see the EU taking a very strong position for the moment. Um, second, the US is now explicitly um, questioning the terms of security partnership with Europe. And third, the US administration is perhaps for the first time 
um, openly hostile towards the European Union and getting closer to the United Kingdom, which in its turn is to the detriment to the EU-UK relations, we feel. So when, you know, considering these strategic issues and strategic autonomy on one side, especially when it comes to defense and functional cooperation on the other side, um, in the end, we felt that we will have a positive, let's say, position on this. And our recommendations is that recommendation is for the EU to take a proactive role, allocate resources and work with the US on common major challenges, namely uh, Russia and China, democratic decline, migration, corruption and money laundering, and social media regulation. And now my colleague Katerina will continue with the other three. or non-military cooperation in the Arctic. Um, Russia could also be considered a strategic uh, partner in containing Turkish hazardous initiatives in the region, most recently the uh, anti kurd military operations and threat of uh, sending Syrian refugees um, to Europe. Um, and uh, touching and related to this topic, melting Arctic not only, uh, will not only impact um, global climate, but also economy. So the EU needs to renew and strengthen its Arctic policy, uh, as well as to develop a clear strategy on how to work with Russia in the Arctic. On the topic of security and defense, recent events ranging from the Huawei case, Turkish intervention in northern Syria, uh, cyber threats to critical infrastructure in Europe, um, have stressed the importance uh, for Europe to develop strategic autonomy in technological, security, and defense dimension. Uh, the next topic we are looking at is the intersection of artificial intelligence, uh, disinformation, and cybersecurity. Uh, so despite their numerous benefits, which were mentioned and touched upon um, during this event, new technologies and artificial intelligence in particular pose new risks to human rights and democratic processes across the EU. Uh, we have seen that algorithms, AI, um, and uh, automation are boosting the efficiency of disinformation campaigns as well as related cyber activities. Uh, so we believe that the new commission needs to pay adequate attention to this intersection um, or, and to AI-powered um, electoral interference in particular. Uh, so we believe that um, it would be uh, valuable to classify electoral interference as um, uh, election systems as um, critical infrastructure, uh, and in result, there will be adequate cybersecurity measures uh, put in place. And we also believe that um, the EU should uh, reinforce the EAS Stratcom Task Force, uh, the EU fu uh, hybrid fusion cell as well as the work of ENISA, the EU cybersecurity agency. So overall, there needs to be more funding directed at the intersection of artificial intelligence and disinformation. So the EU can and should do more in this regard. And the last point uh, where we do see the EU taking um, a global leadership is obviously climate change and is not last and not least. Um, so in addition to the tools that are mentioned in uh, van der Leyen's document, uh, we decided to maybe choose two additional ones we, which we didn't feel that were properly addressed. One is on public procurement and the other one is greening of defense policy. <clears throat> Firstly, um, we propose to consider combine, combining the supply side measures, such as a sustainable investment fund, with the demand side measures. Um, using public procurement as a big opportunity for the future, for big companies to get those big contracts and, um, and you know, to minimize environmental impact in that sense. Uh, this is a huge opportunity because six, we are talking about 16% of GDP, so there's a lot of potential there for green innovation, and we would couple this with toughening regulation on the commercialization of these outputs. Um, secondly, 
while creating the European Defense Union, and I'm gonna read the part of this because I'm not an expert on this topic and uh, there's some good material here. Uh, the aim should be to minimize environmental impact uh, from manufacturing to the end users, so throughout the value chain. Uh, when it comes to production, the highest environmental standards and the best you know, available technologies should be put in place, in principle. In the construction of aircraft and maritime fleets, for example, the EDU itself needs to be responsible for bearing the costs of emissions. Um, then, the EDU must also have special provisions to reinforce uh, the 1949 Geneva Convention. Um, these are articles 35 and 55, for those of you who are more like, experts on the topic. Furthermore, the EDU should introduce even stricter standards for protecting the natural environment during armed conflicts where they are involved. And finally, uh, the EDU should require all these practices to be also implemented by strategic partners such as NATO and UN. Um, I believe this is it from us to open today and uh, we look forward to the discussion with you later. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, ladies. And just one small note, the paper that the young professionals have been working on will be published after Tatra Summit. So please keep an eye out for that because this was just a very short and very brief overview. And now it is my pleasure to hand the floor over to the moderator of our next session, Rebecca Christie. Thank you so much. Panelists, please join me. Welcome to our Saturday morning panel on Capital Markets Union. Ready to rumble. We thank you very much for being here and being with us. We have a really good panel today. We have from Slovenia, Finance Minister Andre Bertonso. We have from Erste Group, Andreas Streichel. And we have from Austrian politics and the European Investment Bank, most recently, Wilhelm Mölterer. We are going to start with a few brief remarks about why there isn't a capital markets union and what we might want to do about that. And then hopefully we will have many questions from you. This is a big topic, public perception of what markets are for and what capital markets are for and how they should work is going to be a big part of any change and any solution that, that comes to bear. So we would very much welcome your thoughts and questions to get a sense of what's most interesting to you. Um, with that, Minister, I think we'd have you go first. Well, good morning to everyone. Uh, in my opinion, uh, several issues relating to capital market union needs to be addressed. Let me name just three important uh, issues. First, we need to articulate it better. And second, it needs to be more or better spread in order to serve our citizens better. Second, we need to gain or regain our citizens' trust in capital markets. And third, we need to make it more compelling. Let me explain why these issues are important. Uh, let me start in my current uh, function as a politician with uh, three political slogans that were said by the new commission. We all know it is people, so we the people of Europe, and our needs need to be served better, and among others, and not limited to capital markets. So we need, in this respect, establish long-term savings and investments instruments in order to attract money from private sector that we, that we need, as discussed in this uh, couple of two days. And second, political slogan that is strategic is sustainability. Not much needs to be said about this because we've been discussing the issue in the last two days. So it includes climate change, it includes uh, cohesion, it includes other investments and of course substantial amount of money that needs to be pumped into these investments to make the world to, to materialize in, in uh, real uh, deeds. Uh, and third, it is digitalization, meaning transformation from standard economy to digitalized economy. In other words, we use the name industry for. Again, 
substantial amounts, and we talk here about billions or in some cases even trillions of euros that are needed in the next decade in order to fund these three uh, priorities. So first, I think we need uh, to establish uh, uh, long-term uh, savings uh, and investment instruments. Some people or some scientists or professionals uh, uh, and a high-level group as well suggested to even change the name Capital Market Unit to Savings and Sustainable Investment Unit. It sounds much better when I, when I hear it from the perspective of people. They would understand it better because capital sometimes have a good or bad connotation. So it is uh, the purpose of this to attract uh, a huge amount of savings we have in the private sector and to build this private-public partnership that we will need to, to establish in order to finance all these uh, activities. And second, we need to build equity market in Europe as it is built, for example, in the United States. And we need to build it massively. And I'm talking here about really tens of billions of dollars that we need to, to attract in this respect. So we need to start from early stage, venture capital market, to late stage, private equity market. All, need, all this needs to be established. Of course, we all this we have in Europe. More, of course, in the western part of Europe, much less in this what we call central eastern Europe. All this needs to be to be established or built up, let's say, to, 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 to make it more, more massive. And third, I think we need to tear down these walls that sti still exist within the European Union regarding uh, what we have now, national capital markets, in order to have these all European capital markets. It sounds so, so uh, uh, unimportant, but I think <coughs> it is really an important issue. We already have a couple of free flows, what we call it in Europe. I think now we have five, and one of them is free flow of capital. Mm -hmm. And we really need to have it that way, that it will work as a free flow within all member states. And in addition to that, I think there are some issues that are related to uh, legal and tax uh, framework. So we will need to establish European uh, framework, legislation, uh, what we call European directions, and let me name just one of them, like withholding taxes. All these issues need to be addressed in order to have what we will say then a complete, efficient, workable capital market uh, in the coming years. Thank you. Thanks. It's a great way to reframe it to think about savings and sustainable investment because getting Europeans to take their savings and do something other than stick it in a bank account forever is a very large cultural shift for some member states. So let's hear from our next panelist, please. Well, I would start from another angle. You have mentioned if you want to really achieve what was, what was indicated as the big, big target uh, for the European Union to be CO2 neutral, we have to talk about investment needs. And uh, some of you have heard already what the Court of Auditors said. Interestingly enough, we need 1.15 trillion euro mm -hmm. up to 2030 per annum. <coughs> and it's so crystal clear that we cannot make this via public money. Full stop. We do not have the resources, and we shouldn't have the resources to, dig, to go into this direction. We need private capital to do it. There is a role, first of all, for the public sector, yes, but not in spending taxpayers' money for crazy things, to spend taxpayers' money for the proper things, like RD, I, education, all these things. And there is a second role for the public sector, which is make a market environment from the regulatory side that attracts private capital. Second, I would plea for having a role for commercial banks in this, in this bigger picture. We need the commercial banks exactly also to, 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 to make the savings working in the right direction, making this uh, for investment. And to be honest, the question in the long run is, is the current regulation on the banking sector and the current environment for the banking sector really a proper one to make 
them able to do so? And I would say, question mark, at least. Maybe taxonomy, maybe is an instrument you write that might help to incentivize sustainable investments out of this. A third element I see is structured financing the PPP market. And I give you just an indication, specifically in these countries we are talking about, the PPP market in the infrastructure sector was quite small before crisis, and post-crisis it went down to zero. Full stop, it came to a halt. And without having PPP market re-established again, we cannot close the investment gaps. The fourth, yes, capital market union is a nice work, but it's simply not existing. We have no capital market union. We have a discussion about that. We do not have even capital markets in respective member states. That means the very fundamental question is that we need this European approach. You have rightly mentioned venture needs European approach, equity needs European approach, we need the infrastructure funds business and we need the energy funds business. These are the big areas, I think. And what I see from the investor's point of view, we cannot be successful if we create regional small things. If you want to have a Chinese investor or an investor from the US, they want to know European structures and not the small regional ones. The question, therefore, is shouldn't we start with a top-down approach on the, on the creation of, for instance, EU Venture Capital Fund? We have done this. A creation of EU uh, Innovation Fund? We have done this. And this is then supported uh, from, the, from the regions. Visegrad could be, for instance, an idea to create something for Visegrad. And last but not least, it's the role of IFIs, it's the role of, of for instance, EIB, and uh, also FCA is a wonderful example, how you can crowd in private capital in joining forces between public sources, a guarantee out of the EU budget, and the financial machinery that's called EIB, and then you attract via 30 billion guarantee a 500 billion investment volume, and you know what is between 30 and 500? It's mm. private capital. And there is a component in which I think is enormously important, that's the blending capacity between structural funds and private money financial instruments, and the advisory component to make it, to make it happen. Without advice, without capacity building, without a strong governance, you, you will see that we cannot make it. That means you need the public sector also in this role to advise together with the private, with the private sector. And the story is quite simply, for EIB, it is uh, lending, blending, and advising. And thanks to FC, we have done a wonderful thing in exactly blending the public sources with private, private, private money. This should be replicated not just on the EU level, potentially also on the national level. Thank you so much for those thoughts. As we go to our last panelist, I'd like you also, and I think you will do this anyway in your remarks, but to talk about the dangers of Europe outsourcing its capital market activity elsewhere in the world. If there isn't capital markets union in Europe, if there aren't capital markets in various member states, people are going to invest overseas, and what risks do those leave us For open sure. to? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, maybe some of you know that uh, Mr. Molter also was a Minister of Finance. Um, he left in October 2008, his job, and then the financial crisis started. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so now with the Slovenian Minister of Finance, um, this is now the fourth Minister of Finance that I have the pleasure on sitting on a panel here, last year with the German and the French Minister of Finance. Um, and uh, there must be something in the air here uh, that makes Ministers of Finance uh, liking capital markets. Huh? Because all four of them said, you know, we desperately need a capital market. Now we have the French, the German, the Slovenian, and the Austrian ex-minister of finance who all tell us we need a capital market. Somehow, when they leave uh, this place here, things change. Um, uh, because, you know, when the two... I don't maybe some of you remember that Mr. Olaf Scholz actually said last year... Germany leads, needs at least 50% of the economy to be financed by uh, capital markets. Um, then the week later, those two ministers of finance met, 
and discuss the financial transaction tax. Fortunately, so far, that has not been accomplished because that would finally kill every little capital market activity that we have um, in Europe. So my hope now is in you um, playing an important role in Europe and getting the others, uh, giving them the fresh air um, of uh, the mountains in Slovakia. You know, the, 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 the effects of not having a capital market uh, in our region and in Europe overall is a lot more dramatic than we, than we all think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there must be a reason why politicians talk about it but don't do it. And they've been talking about it for a long time, and they have been talking for a long time, yes, we need more capital market in Europe, but nothing is happening. And why is nothing happening? Because it's not popular. Because the number of people who actually understand that we need a capital market is rather limited. For most of the politicians, once they think about the next election, they don't even dare to use the word capital. Because capital has a bad connotation in Europe. And it's the same whether you're a Christian Democrat or a social uh, Democrat. You are basically telling your people, and you have been brought up in an environment where you say, saving, that's the good thing to do. The really serious people save. Capital market is about investing. And investing is speculation. So the capital market is for the rich. And we don't get our votes from the rich. We want uh, the people to vote for us. So we are for saving. And if you talk to a German Minister of Finance, whether it's Olaf Scholz or Schäuble or whoever, what they will tell you is, yeah, it's nice that we have the large companies like BMW or Mercedes or Bayer, for the moment maybe not so nice, um, <laughs> but it's okay. But the real backbone of the German economy are the family companies, the SMEs. Those are the people that think long term. They do not have to publish their results every quarter. That's why they can be sustainable. They don't think about return on equity. If things don't go bad, they don't kick out people. It's the big, bad capital market companies that optimize their profits at the cost of the people. So the real strengths in our economy are the family-owned companies. There is something to it. There is a truth to it. But if you turn it around, what they actually say is, that those people in our country that keep 100% of their business by themselves are the good ones, and the ones that are willing to let the people, the pension funds, participate in their economic success are the bad ones. Now, if we do not get that out of the heads of the politicians, you can forget the capital market for Europe, because nothing is going to happen. It has to be a major reset of the minds of the people who run Europe. And my hope that this reset will actually happen is rather limited. Because if you want to establish a capital market, you need a capital market culture. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a capital market culture, you need financial education. Because if the people in the countries in which we live don't understand what a stock is and what the difference between interest and the dividend is, you can't let them participate in the capital market because they're going to get screwed. So one of the biggest, most important prerequisites for a capital market is financial education. In which of our countries do we teach finance, economics and business to young kids? In which of our countries? None. In which countries in Europe do we have a capital market culture? Switzerland? A little bit. The UK? A little bit. Rest is more or less very little. Hmm? 
So one is not in the EU and will never be, and the other one is leaving at the end of the month. Hmm? Now we're hoping for the French and the Germans to create a capital market culture in Europe. Good luck. Good luck. That's all I can say to that. Now the effects of that are the following. Let me just talk about our little Austria. Hmm? And it's not going to be different in Slovakia, it's not different in the Czech Republic, and it's not even different in Germany. We're telling our people, save. So put your money in the bank. Hmm? Great, you get zero interest. Buy a life insurance contract. Great, you get nothing. Buy a building society contract. Great, you get nothing. Buy something really safe. Hmm? Buy a bond of the Republic of Austria you get negative. Hmm? Um, buy a bond of Republic of Slovakia, you get zilch, nada, nothing. Hmm? So all the things that we are being told are great and serious, and for the proper serious people who are not speculators, you lose, you lose. In Austria this year, all the savings of private individuals will go down by 6 billion euros. Well, politicians are telling us for the moment, and not only politicians, entrepreneurs. Do you believe that entrepreneurs in Austria want to go public? <laughs> they want to keep it to themselves, because if they go public, they have to be transparent. And if you're transparent, you can't evade taxes. So we need to incentivize transparency in Europe. This is a wonderful thing, you know, all the things I'm telling you, this is how you get votes. Yeah? If you go out and tell your entrepreneurs, well, I want you to be transparent, hmm? please vote for me. Hmm? Okay, I, I want you to publish all your profits, please vote for me. Hmm? This is so unpopular with all kinds of people that you need incredibly strong, long-term thinking politicians who realize that if we don't start today, we will lose out completely to the US and China. So, you know, great if we start doing it in Europe. I don't believe in it. Let's start here in this region, at mm -hmm. least. Hmm? Let's do something. Absolutely. Let's do something, please. Let's not wait for Germany and France to do it. It will never happen. <coughs> start here. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. We have this great philosophical tension right now where the monetary policymakers who are pushing rates into negative territory are doing it precisely to create an incentive to get the money out to go to work. The goal would be to get the money out of the savings account and out of away from the very, very, very safe government bonds into some of these other projects, whether it's public infrastructure or, or medium-sized companies or scalable startups or all of these things. At the same time, we do have the politicians saying, ooh, market speculators, the next crisis is going to come from the market and it's not fair that you're losing on your savings. You should sit tight and we'll find a way to get your risk-free savings to give you more money back. That's a, a thing that I've been hearing. You might have heard it here yesterday a time or two. Uh, do we have any questions from you all about the parts of the, the capital markets concept that you find to be the most interesting or the most worthy of debate? Do we have any, do we have any women who would like to ask a question? Because I haven't heard a woman ask a question <laughs> in two days. <laughs> No, okay, Mr. Romania, thank either. you. <laughs> that, that was a sexist <laughs> remark. <laughs> you know, I find that, if you will allow me, that the people who say we shouldn't look at gender and we shouldn't look at race are the people whose daily lives allow them to go through life not noticing. If no one mentions to me that I'm a woman, strangely, <laughs> it doesn't make me not a woman, it doesn't make there be more women up here on the panel, and it doesn't get more women's voices speaking. Were I to be a black person, the fact that none of you might mention it would not change that fact that I would be, and you would all be noticing. So I think we need to be honest with ourselves about whose voices we're hearing and how we're hearing from them. I think as Central and Eastern Europeans, you're in a position to appreciate this because how often do you go to these meetings and you listen to the French and the Germans and maybe the Dutch?
Dutch, who are, you know, a smaller member state, but representing a different thing. So I'm, gl I'm glad to be here and to learn from you and to hear a different set of voices than I usually hear. And I hope you'll think of that when deciding who to include. There are a lot of people working on these issues who are with all respect, not just politicians who've been fighting the good fight for 30 years. There are a lot of new voices and new people trying to work on this. And um, I'm just looking forward to hearing from all of them. And Romania is certainly a very fast growing and rapid economy that has been contributing a lot. And I, I would very much like to hear Thank your you question. Thank you very much, My name is Andrei <laughs> coming from Banca Transilvania, Chief Economist. A very good uh, uh, opportunity for me to address two very uh, small questions because everybody knows about capital markets, about incomplete banking union, about several other projects, but when you have to deliver, it's impossible. So my first question is for all the panelists. Do you think it's any interdependence between the uh, um, realization of capital markets and the fiscal integration in Europe? Because my view is that capital markets union is impossible without having a political union and a fiscal integration. In the US, the capital markets are working because there is a fiscal integration. And my second question is, do you see any interdependence between capital markets union and convergence of digitalization in Europe? Because I had a presentation in Singapore about capital markets and digital revolution. And Europe, unfortunately, it's a very... It's very a laggard in terms of um, digitalization and capital markets union, and that, that has a very big cost in terms of financing. So European, despite the fact that interest rates are negative, in terms of equity is premium, we are higher in t uh, compared with both US and China. Thank you very much. So those are great questions. If finances are fragmented, how can we have a unified market? And is FinTech gonna be a way around to get some of these cross-border obstacles? Let's start at the end and come back down. Well, I would say, first a comment to, to Andreas. Uh, I fully agree on the issue of financial education. Absolutely. I fully agree also on the issue of, 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 of having a regional <laughs> approach. I find, for instance, very interesting the idea on the Visegrad to create a V4 institution as a promotional, as a type of a promotional institution mm -hmm. or bank. These are initiatives, they are really making me happy. And the third question or the third comment is, first of all, banks are not totally innocent uh, uh, in this respect. And my argument as a former politician is if you really want to su succeed with the ambition the politicians are now having, making Europe green, making Europe strong, and keep Europe united. You can translate this into climate, competitiveness, and cohesion. Green, strong, and united. You need Unlimited cash means investment. Without private, this doesn't, it doesn't work. That means if politicians are promising things, they need to crowd in private capital, otherwise their promises are simply not, uh, not, not possible to, to achieve. And I think here is the, the real point. If we want to achieve what we want to have, we need the private capital to, to be attracted. And to your questions, on the first question, yes, I fully agree. No doubt about that. We need that there is this, this, this independence with the, with, the fiscal, with the fiscal concept. And by the way, the criticism on, e, in, on, on ECP sometimes is based on the non-actions of politicians. Because ECP jumped into territories where politicians should have acted. And on digital, I have, I, have, I would say, so far, two ways of thinking. Yes, if you go into the idea of, of, of digital financial markets, fintechs and other things, they might, uh, they might create a totally new architecture. True so. But on the other hand, when you see how far away Europe is from the digital, let's say, for front running, how far away Europe is from <coughs> artificial intelligence and all of these, Maybe we lose again an opportunity. It means the opportunity is there, but to make it working needs again investment into, into, into digitalizing the, com the, the companies and also the continent and also the, the, the public sector. The, therefore, I'm a bit 
I would say ambiguous on that. Yes, you are right. But on the other hand, whether we can make it needs again investment into digital. Huge. I mean, and not just money-wise, by the way. Minister Vertonso, I would love to hear from you. And also, I know Globsec has written a paper about ways to get people from this region more involved in, in showing leadership in this area. So what are your thoughts on these topics? Well, there are regarding the uh, regional issue and establishing regional funds, uh, I'm of the opinion that uh, all regional, let's call it national markets, are in effect... Uh, with exception of Poland, to some extent, yeah. very small uh, capital markets. We have all made attempts in, in uh, this respect, and none of the economies in this region uh, has an effective, strong uh, capital market. So I think, uh, <coughs> and now I will sound maybe more a politician than a, a finance professional, uh, we need a uh, European approach. Mm -hmm. We need to build a strong, large, all European capital market. Otherwise, we will stay fragmented. Uh, let me say that prior to taking uh, the office of the Ministry of Finance uh, 15 months ago, uh, I spent 20 years in the finance industry. And I'm now on the both sides. I talk, as my colleague uh, said, and I'm still of the opinion that we need to do some very important, strong steps uh, in the directions that we are now uh, uh, contemplated. So we need all European approach, and in this respect, we need to stay united. And we have set clear goals. And we need to combine this strategic goals with people's needs and need to attract them into this equation. And it is clear to all of us that absolutely massive amounts of money will be needed to materialize these goals. To these goals or these dreams to come true, we will need to attract huge amounts of money. Regional funds or uh, regional uh, financial debts are limited, are too small to achieve these goals. Even European amounts are too small to achieve these goals. So it needs to be a global, global perspective. So in this respect, we need to, to, to stay on the track. I know it takes time. It is sometimes frustrating for me even to deliberate on issue late in the evening, sometimes early in the morning, mm -hmm. to get to some, some conclusion, to get consensus on some issues. But we need to understand the European perspective. It comes from our cultures, it comes from our history. And the way the Europe was established and the way the Europe is developing. We are nevertheless not so homogeneous as China and the US. And we don't have both policies, as, as you rightly mentioned. We have only monetary policy and we have 27 different fiscal policies within the European unity. And any change in respect to fiscal issues needs to be made by unanimous vote. So, not an easy task. So, this is a sort of a limitation. But nevertheless, I feel a strong desire to push forward both to complete the banking union and to push forward the capital market union. I think we need both, and we need both them in a complete form. So all three pillars of banking union, and we need a working, strong working uh, capital market. And I true, I know from my management perspective, the most difficult and uh, the, 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 the issue that takes the most time is to change corporate culture within the company, even more so to change the, the culture on the national level, on national levels in respect to, to, to the capital. I used to say, uh, uh, for, for example, for, for Slovenia, that instead of capital market, we have a loan market. Basically, everything was financed through banking system, much to our regret and much to our cost. We, we have to capitalize banks, and in the end, we have to sell all systemic banks uh, in, in Slovenia. So I believe that to finance our future, we really need strong all-European capital market. Now, how to get there? Of course, we will need, in my opinion, harder. So, can we do it? 
I think we must do it and we must push it harder. But of course, on the political level, we have that consensus. But consensus takes time, unfortunately. In the industry, I understand the industry I'm coming from, it's much faster. So companies can move much faster than, than the state systems. But nevertheless, hand in hand, I think uh, the only direction, the right direction in this respect, again, would be not to develop small regional markets, of course. There will be a compilation of all national, regional markets, but in the end, we need a very strong European capital market. And the union is the right uh, response to that question. Thank you for that thoughtful answer, and especially for that example of how cross-border investment ends up coming in in time of crisis and in time of yeah. weakness in a way that, that people are dissatisfied with instead of in a time of building and a time of strength. Um, Mr. Moltera would like I to... Just one, one, one issue, which I find interesting. Oh, if I look, for instance, into the VC market in, in Europe, we all know that there is, there is a big gap compared to, to peers. But what we do have is we have a European institution that's called European Investment Fund, which is a subsidiary of EIB. Mm -hmm. EAF is invested, I think, in 150 venture capital funds. Establishing, let's say, a, 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 European, a European standard indirectly by doing so. Or if you go for EIB as a European institution, if we do PPP in the European market, we set standards. It's a public-private partnership. It's a public-private oh. partnership, but we set European standards. And I think we shouldn't wait until the very final close of a capital market union, because this may, might take years. We should start to incentivize using existing structures. Yeah. And I think this combination of, of the role of public institutions and the private sector may also close, let's say, this gap that exists also on the psychological side. This I find a very interesting experience I have out of this FC. When we started this exercise, there was big, big doubts whether you can make it. FC is the European the Fund, European for, strategic fund for Strategic the Investment, plan. call it Juncker Fund, you know, this is this <laughs> guarantee facility. So the target is 500 billion, now we stand at 440. We are not talking about theory, we are doing it simply. And I think there is a lot of things we can really, I would say, quick start and put, put additional firepower in. I give you just one example, Minister. On the InvestEU, that's the next phase of this idea, having a, a guarantee, they're transforming this into investment. There is a voluntary contribution of member states out of structural funds money of 5%, voluntary. Why aren't we courageous enough in saying, okay, let's make it 10% and mandatory? 10% and mandatory. Because if you make it again voluntary, you act against the idea of a capital market union. Those are elements which we have to tackle immediately, and we, we still have a chance. MFF is not finally decided. Let's do it. So we have a few minutes left in our panel. Before I give the floor to Andreas, who will give us a stirring call to action, I know, on our way out, I would just like to ask one more time, um, Another version of this question we got about fiscal union, which is in the absence of large-scale joint public borrowing, which isn't going to happen, how can the private sector create a common market? You're never going to have a U.S. Treasury bond with you know, trillions and trillions of safe assets to anchor all kinds of other trading here. So what can Europe do to create a market for all sorts of other things that people can buy and sell and invest in sustainably? Well, very well, I, I agree with what um, uh, both of them said. You have to do little things because you, you can't wait for the great moment when we finally realize we need a, a capital markets union. There are lots of things um, you can do to make life a little bit better, but um, there is a lot of um, urgency. And the one thing that we don't need, uh, in my view, is uh, sort of a, a strong European uh, treasury uh, market. Uh, we, we have enough paper uh, running around in Europe. 
Um, and the, the sort of the urgency is in, incredible for the moment because we're destroying so much wealth in Europe. Hmm? People, actually, young people these days can only live off their income. Hmm? It's almost impossible for a young family to um, to make money um, aside uh, from from their working income. And they're looking forward 40, 50 years from now to a time where it will be very, very difficult actually to get a decent pension. So you know, we're talking about one of the most serious subjects that we presently um, have in Europe and we need to act. That's why I think we, we, we need to get uh, politicians in Europe to, to react on that. The effect of the negative interest rates, and that, that's why I think you know, we, we, we don't need a backup paper in, in Europe for the moment, is a lot more dramatic than we all believe because you have a generation that is growing up for the moment that um, is starting to think about finance at a time where the time value of money doesn't exist anymore. To me, I'm a rather old guy, it was shocking when for the first time my institution issued a covered bond uh, with a negative interest rate. So, and then you know, we're going out to our investors and tell them, you know, buy 1,000 of Erste Group, and great, seven years from now, I give you back 970 euros. The fantastic investment. <coughs> um, you know that some weeks ago, the first um, mortgage loan in Denmark mm -hmm. was issued with a negative interest rate. Now, th think about it. How long, if we don't change this, how long will it take that um, a young lady goes to the media market um, and she wants to buy a flat screen. A flat screen costs 1,000 euros. And next to the shop, uh, there's a little corner where a bank um, has its products list. They said, wait, 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 don't buy the flat screen in the shop take a loan from me for 1,000 euros, I give the cash to the seller of the flat screen, and I give you back 50 euros. So if you borrow money, you buy the flat screen not for 1,000 euros, you buy it for 950 euros. It is going to happen. This is how our children are being brought up they have a completely crooked way of looking at finance. And at the same time, they don't know anything about capital markets. Now, if politicians, let me say it again, don't realize today that if they don't really start to act and to turn Europe into a continent where hopefully about 40, 50% of our economy will be financed by capital markets, um, and I can say that as a banker, one of the biggest problems of Europe is the strong link between Indeed. banking and politics, uh, between state finances and bank finances, and now the regulators in Europe think about, due to the uncompetitiveness of the European banking system, we need bigger banks. That's a complete mistake. We need less banks and less banking and more capital markets. Reduce the importance of European banking is one of the most important issues for politicians in this region. And I will use every occasion I still have in the next 50 years to make a point out of that. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and attention this morning. I wish you a wonderful rest of your time. Thank you to the organizers. And I hope we've given you some things to think about in terms of how you invest and who you pay to do it.